Well, welcome back everyone to another interview here today on my channel. Today, we are gonna be talking to an individual who has over 40 years of producing and engineering experience, starting his own studio in his basement back in the 70s called Inner Ear Studios. He is an individual who is very influential on the DC punk scene, producing and engineering for bands like Minor Threat, Fugazi, Teen Idols. So as he tells his story today, we're going to be listening with our inner ears. So everyone watching and everyone listening, please give a warm and comforting welcome to Mr. Don Zentara. Don, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. I can hear the applause. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can just hear him like the standing ovations here today. That's a, a typical response for my interviews, of course. I have my questions laid out here. Usually the way I have this set up is I like to just start from the beginning. So uh, tell us your journey before starting your own studio, like growing up in your early childhood, college days and, you know, getting drafted into Vietnam. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, boy, it is a long and complicated journey for sure. I was sort of pushed into playing or learning an instrument about when I was 10 or so. I grew up in a Polish community and the Polish instrument of choice, of course, was the accordion. <laughs> but at the time, uh, Elvis was emerging. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had the opportunity to take up the guitar instead. And of course, you know, there was no no contest. I mean, the guitar, you get the girls, uh, accordion, you get the waltz. <laughs> <laughs> and the Scots. And the, yes, exactly. So I took up the guitar and uh, took lessons for a few years and then um, put it down. And it revived when a friend came over and showed me... Uh, how to play popular songs that sort of pulled me back into uh playing the guitar mm -hmm. and uh, just playing more songs just going over and over because i knew these songs and because of their familiarity it was easy to uh it was easy to practice and i formed the band with a friend of mine from a couple doors away um, you know, a much of a band as you can when you're about 12 or 13 years old. Right. Yeah. And, of uh, yeah, exactly. They're, they ain't going to go too far, but <laughs> at that stage, you don't have too many responsibilities besides, uh, homework and, uh, going to bed on time. So <laughs> it works out. Right. So we, we, um, we started playing, rehearsing, um, playing for very, very small little get togethers. And at one point, you know, we, we wrote a couple songs and figured, um, hey, you know, it'd be really nice to have a record. And I just noticed that downtown in Rochester, New York, where I grew up, uh, there was a building with a door that said Rochester Recording Company or something of that nature. So I said, you know, let's 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 go down there. So we took a bus. Uh, we had our guitars in hand and our, you know, small amplifiers and went down there and uh, knocked on the door and the man answered and uh, he said, we'd like to make a record. And he said, uh, well, do you have a tape? And this was all new to me. I mean, I didn't know what he was talking about. What do you mean tape? We've got, I've got, we've got our guitars. So we could play for you right here live. What, what could be better? Um, he says you got to have a tape. So that introduced me into the whole process of uh, making a record and uh, having to make a record through uh, the normal means, the way most musicians do it. Uh, you make a tape with tracks on it. You mix those tracks together. They get mastered. You take the master down to the recording company that makes the 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 plates for the uh for the records mm -hmm. and then it gets made and all that it's you know a very very um uh factory type situation so that was my introduction to the whole thing high school happened i was a, a solid c minus student uh, and uh, i went to college uh at syracuse university mm -hmm. uh for art and painting mainly um printmaking as it worked out Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, when I graduated from that, I was, this was 1970 and the, the draft lottery was happening and my number was number one by my birthday. Mm -hmm. So I figured, uh, well, my number's up. 
so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So I applied for a postgraduate work at West Virginia University, uh, trying to outrun the physical that the Army needed to, to get in. Went to university at in Morgantown, and um, they said, well, come to um, the Rochester thing to get your physical. I, I wrote back to them saying, I'm in Morgantown, West Virginia. And they fixed it up so I could get a physical in Morgantown. By that point, oh, it's Christmas vacation. I'm in Rochester, New York. <laughs> uh, so they fixed it up so I can get it in Rochester. I was back in Morgantown again. You know how this goes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the summertime, um, I was going to be there for a while at Rochester. So they they got me. But I noticed that there was a special program at the time. I, the Army's running specials like everybody else does. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and you could have a guaranteed education in an area of your choice. They had a bunch of different uh, choices in there. I had always been interested in, in uh, the electronics phase of things because I had dabbled with it. We had made our own guitar amplifiers. It was uh, it was just an area of interest to me. So I uh, signed up for electronics, electronics training. You know, of course. This was, I'm, I was very naive at this point. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that basically electronics training after you get out, basically you're repairing walkie talkies and the rice patties. Uh, I thought it'd be something more glamorous than that. Walkie uh, talkies. Interesting. <laughs> exactly. Not really, not really what you thought when you're going into the field, huh? No, no. You think, you always think grander things are going to be right. happening. You're thinking like and, the giant, giant, like Wyatt amps or whatever, not, not like these little handheld devices. Exactly. Exactly. I went into basic training after basic training. Uh, I went to the place where the, uh, electronics training would take place. And I just waited there, uh, for months on end. Eventually they called me, uh, into the main offices there and said, look, we've got a lot of people who are looking to be trained in electronics right now, but we noticed that you have degrees in art. Uh, at that point, I had an MFA in art. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a BFA in art. And um, they said, you know, a, a week, instead of going to electronics training, why don't you go to a place we have in Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, do drawing and painting and all kinds of other graphic stuff for the army. You know, you can't <laughs> really, it's a great opportunity. Hmm. Uh, and Alexandria, Virginia is probably better than uh, South Vietnam, I imagine. Yeah, just, just, just a little. <laughs> Less people shooting at you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, as long as you stay out of DC. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, uh, I went there and was there for a couple years. When I uh, got out, um, I was basically playing in bands pretty much all the time, whenever I could find one. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in a band and we needed a demo tape. And I had always had tape recorders, stereo tape recorders at the time, two track tape recorders, left and right channel. That's the only thing you could get uh, at that point. This is about 73, 74. We wanted to make a demo tape. And I, I think I bought a small mixer for the instruments and uh, we borrowed a whole bunch of microphones and we had basically one channel of vocals and one channel of music that was it we started you know we we started on the journey of actually having to make some music from that uh, and of course when you do that you gather a lot of other things like cables and connections and music stands and things uh, that microphone stands, booms. So I had all these things now after the demo was made. It was, you know, pretty decent. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few bands had asked me to uh, make some recordings of them. And so I did. And that started me off into going into things. Uh, eventually, I would get a four track tape recorder. And we're talking about really basic, basic stuff here. I would make my first little mixer because companies like Mackie 
or Behringer or um, any of the companies that make small mixers today uh, just weren't around. Mm -hmm. They did not make small mixers. There was no such thing as home recording. You just didn't do it. But I started in on it. And what I couldn't find in the stores or the hi-fi stores, uh, there were no guitar centers. Basically, there was hi-fi stores. And what I didn't find there, I built or tried to build. Sometimes, well, pretty much more more successfully than not successfully. It just grew and grew, and um, I got more tracks as it went along, and I set up a bigger uh, studio area and kept growing and growing and growing one by one, and until it uh, came, you know, too big to be in my house, mm -hmm. and I rented a building. That became the inner ear studio uh, on uh, South Oakland Street in Arlington. And that was in uh, 1990. That place just recently got taken over by Arlington County, correct? That's correct. That is correct. Now, before that, though, before the 90s, like when you first opened up your studio, this was in your personal house. Like you said, yes. back then, home recording wasn't a thing. Working from home, as you will, way before the COVID days wasn't essentially a thing back then. So right. tell me, what was that process like, turning your house into a musical studio and... and uh, helping these bands record their music. Tell me tell me about that. Well, I, I skipped over a bunch of things for sure. Yeah. Uh, at the time, once I left the Army, I um, I went to work for the National Gallery of Art. Along at night, I would be recording bands, and during the day, I'd be recording, or I'd be working for the National Gallery of Art in the prints and drawings department there, mm -hmm. uh, preparing prints and drawings for exhibits. During this time, there was... Oh, about halfway through my 10-year stint there, uh, there was a tour of the gallery. And they wanted to show us some of the the behind-the-scenes inner workings of the gallery, which everybody knows probably that the, the National Gallery of Art is a very, very big building. And there's lots of offices uh, that are in the background or hidden behind the walls and things like that. And one of them they showed us was they were building a recording studio to... They had a thing called an acoustic guide where you went around for pictures and you, you had a radio transmitter that picked up audio and that told you about the uh, picture itself. Mm -hmm. Usually usually paintings, but uh, some sculptures were in there too. And uh, they were building a recording studio. Now, I had kept up with doing homemade electronics or just electronics in general. Uh, during all this time and I learned a lot and I built a few bunch of things that were really like compressors and uh, certainly mixers and uh, reverb units and things like that and they were having trouble hooking up uh, a mixer there was a power supply if I remember correctly and I said well you know this is what you have to do to get it going so the person in charge says well tell you what how about you be the engineer here at the studio in the gallery so i just flipped from prints and drawings into being the engineer at the national gallery of art uh for the next i don't know four or five years and then i eventually left the gallery to manage a, a studio a private studio uh, but i just couldn't handle the fact that i didn't have my hands on the workings and the, the knobs and the faders and everything like that. I just had to be in the, I wanted to be in the middle of it. Hmm. So I just stopped that and uh, just started recording on my own, which was a very scary thing. If anybody knows, you know, of course, about breaking out and, and starting a business on your own. Uh, you do it with a lot of... <laughs> A lot of trepidity, I guess. Yeah, and definitely a lot of fear. Like you said, it's essentially entrepreneurship where you're leaving a consistent income compared to now you're doing something on your own. And at the beginning, it's terrifying. It's like an entrepreneurship. It's like someone who is an entertainer. You know, like let's say someone has a YouTube channel like myself. You know, if you're starting off and you're starting to get paid, if you see an opportunity to go full time, when you take that risk, it's terrifying because that could fall in the next three months so you don't really know where it's going to go but at the same time there's 
it's been historically shown that when you take that risk, sometimes it really pays off. And I think you're a great example of that because look where we are now, years later, you know, Inner Ear Studios is like the place for the DC punk scene. So even though it was a scary thing at the time, it definitely say, it definitely seemed to have worked out well in your favor. Now, I've actually read that when you first opened your studio, punk music was not what you worked on initially, not until essentially like the late 70s, early 80s. What helped you get into the genre by the turn of the decade? Timing. Everything was timing. First of all, I'm my inclination to musical styles at the time uh, and to this day is more in the pop vein, uh, pop in a sense uh, that was pop, not the pop of uh, 2023, <laughs> um, but pop music as it, as it was then, something with a good melody and uh, a song structure. And so that was what we did. And that's what the bands I was playing. And that's what we played, songs of that ilk. But um, at the time, at the time I was starting to build this little dinky studio with marginal equipment, uh, the punk scene was coming in. I was just there at the right place in the right time to catch their aesthetic. Um, I will, I will tell you, I'm going to describe how I sort of got into this. Um, basically, I was recording a lot of my friends' bands, um, and one of them was playing at a little tavern. They asked me to record them live. So I had brought my little setup there, and, uh, and believe me, it was small, really small. And I recorded them, and at the same time, there was another band playing with them, as is often the case. Uh, it was the Slicky Boys. and. Uh, Martin Kane asked me to uh, record them if I had an extra roll of tape. And I just happened to have one. So I said, sure, I'll do it. I recorded them. And at the time, their agent slash manager was Skip Groff, mm -hmm. who owned the record company. I'm sorry, who owned a record store in the um, um, Rockville area. He and um, some of the Slicky Boys came back to my place to mix uh, the tape that they did. He was connected very well to the punk music scene at the time, all alternative music at the time. And he introduced me and got me going with a lot of the other bands. Uh, he introduced me to um, um, Teen Idols and um, a few others that I, I just can't remember the Sometimes they got together and broke up within months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the Bad Brains were one of them, too. He said, record these guys. You know, they're, they're going to be fun. And they certainly were. So he got me into it. Uh, and I established a relationship with Ian MacKay uh, because of that. He being in the Teen Idols and, you know, later going on to doing great things um, in a whole bunch of different bands and of course, Discord Records. So that's what it was. If if I was starting out with that caliber of equipment at this stage of the game, uh, I wouldn't last at all. But it was just the punk mentality was not focused on how expensive your equipment it was. The punk mentality was more, uh, let's, let's see if we can capture this energy mm -hmm. that we have. Right. And I guess I did it. Now, I'll be honest, I I don't listen to a lot of a lot of punk music. I like more metal and like classic rock. But I do know that punk was always about like not really the uh, the expensiveness or sometimes even just the talent. It's more just about the energy and like you said, the aesthetic that it gives off. And that was really more about what the scene was about. They just wanted to at least have someone who could just record that and make it a part of history. Yes. And uh I was there. And now from like a personal preference, like now I, I know you because I've seen like uh, the Brian, I think Brian Davis, I saw the video where like you talked about it, where it was like, you know, you weren't there to tell them how it was done. You were just there to help record it. Did you actually like what you were hearing? Did you like that raw energy that was coming, the loudness, the heaviness from the bands that you were listening to from like a personal preference? It was mixed. I certainly liked their enthusiasm and their energy that they put behind it. I was, it was greater than a lot of the pop bands. I, I like their music of the day. 
Mm -hmm. um, some of the pop bands, you could go back and you could see them on YouTube now. They would be on television shows and things like that, standing there like statues playing. Yeah. And that just didn't work for them, for punk music at all. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I didn't necessarily agree with uh, some of the melodies that were going on. Um, but that was changing and I tried, tried to change that if I could sneak in little things, um, hints of different things to try to get them to be more melodic, less not thinking about the vocals. Let me put it that way. It's <laughs> sort of double negative, but they, you know, a lot of times the bands would, would, uh, form a band and okay, you're the guitar player, you're the drummer, you're the bass player. Uh, well. I guess we need to, someone needs to sing. So it, it wasn't really figured out too well. They just, um, you know, someone sang because uh, by default, they, I don't know, they just, they were the singer. So that happened. And I felt that the vocals were a bigger part than they got played in the whole song. I mean, your voice is also an instrument and it's just as important, if not the most important part of a song sometimes. Yeah exactly exactly and it yeah and it worked for them in the sense that during shows uh the singer's voice may have given out and all he could do is scream <laughs> <laughs> i mean hell <laughs> i mean as someone who can't sing or necessarily scream you know good for them if it worked for them more power to them <laughs> yeah exactly no they were doing what they were doing what was very timely to the music that they had on hand. And it worked. It definitely worked. They were conveying the energy that was needed, uh, the enthusiasm that was needed. It was the uh, the youthful spirit, I guess. Uh, you know, it sounds trite, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Right, because another thing, too, about punk, a lot of it is youth. And what I'm, I mean by that is a lot of it is like that teenage angst. You know, we've seen it from decades, like from the 60s with like the Who and like the Small Faces, the 70s with like the Sex Pistols, the 80s with like Fugazi, Minor Threat. You know, like punk has always been about like youth, you know, young anger. And um, that kind of, I think, toppled more than the actual experience or technological equipment itself now you've gone on and produced and engineered for you know let's call it for what it is notable punk bands on the dc scene like i've mentioned before minor threat fugazi teen idols now you may have already touched on upon this but i'll just ask it again just to be safe throughout your years of working with these bands what have you found to be a key element in the concept of punk music thoughtfulness of how you're going to present the song very important the presentation like i said a lot of the early bands of the, the 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, uh, when you see them, how they performed on shows or whenever they were recorded or videoed, um, there was not too much presentation. They would stand there and they would play their instruments competently, hopefully, and that was it. It was over, people would clap and go home. For the punk or the alternative music crowd, uh, they got more into how do we get this over to people so that they can embrace it? How do we get this to accept this this, this song? Uh, because I know, I know we don't have the best instruments. I know that our amplifiers sometimes break down. Uh, I know we've got lots of different faults. I know that we aren't the best singers or the best players in the world, but we want to get this over to the crowd. How do we do this? And they thought about that and they figured their youthfulness and their energy, uh, what would, would carry them. Like you said, you've seen it in the different decades, not just for like the like what we know is the punk music like from the 70s and 80s even like the 90s with alternative music with grunge you know it, like that message carried the same there and even in the 60s or you know when garage rock was kind of the term they used back then before the grunge word even came to be as someone like myself who essentially has no idea how engineering for a band works like you mentioned all these things like reverb and compressors i'm like whew, next planet i don't even know what that means what is your usual process in helping a band with shaping their record i mean that i know that may be kind of a broad question but like what is like your usual day-to-day -day when it comes to engineering or producing for a band having them forget about the equipment 
Okay. And that was what I was hoping to do at the, at the, at the old studio and here too, just have so many distractions that you don't worry too much about equipment or things like that. Leave that to me. I'll take care of that. You just worry about you, what you're going to present to people. Uh, play competently, sing competently, uh, get it all the way, way you need to have it. Uh, do the rehearsal beforehand, do all the necessary uh, arrangements that, you know, you have to make as a band, you know, make sure your equipment is going and in, in, in going to work all the time. Uh, things, things that more introspective, more what you should be thinking about the songs, the, the, the lyrics to the songs, but not the other stuff, not the wires and gadgets and all that things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all. Unfortunately, I can't cover it up. It's there. You have to see it, but I would rather it disappear in your eyes. I've seen videos where, you know, not just of your studio, but like when a band's in a studio in general, you go behind that glass wall, you see all of those buttons, those like knobs that they push up and everything. And you're like, what is this Space Odyssey equipment here? What is this? This is just to make a four minute song. Wow. But that is a good, like, I like how you went more ph philosophical rather than like physical with that answer, because it's like you tell the bands, listen, don't worry about all that crap you see behind the glass. Let me take care of that. You focus on the song. And it's like a teamwork there. I it's like, like that. everything else. I mean, you have uh, uh, you have professionals in every field. They don't want to explain what they're doing in detail to you and you don't want to hear it basically uh you just want them to do their job just you know if it's a financial man that's helping you with uh, whatever budget you have or portfolio you know just 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 make sure that it, it goes well for me <laughs> you know don't don't tell me about how this went up point two uh points or whatever that's all that's garbage you know, just, just do it just do you know if you're if you you hired a plumber uh plumbers don't like people looking over their shoulders and right. advising them and you don't want to be there you're paying them a lot of money to get the job done right mm. and that's what they should be doing and yeah. Uh, that's the way they work the best. If they get involved with the the um, the minutia of it all, mm. uh, they are thinking less about what they have to do for their art, and that's not good. Right, exactly. You need full concentration on the art, and you yeah. worry about the more complicated stuff. Again, exactly. it's a teamwork, and it works out great. Now, you've mentioned in this interview and in past interviews before how when working with these artists, you used a lot of homemade equipment, which honestly, these artists liked because it helped give out that raw, pure energy. Um, since having your home studio again in your home again since 2022, uh, do you still use a lot of homemade equipment today when working with bands? No, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, times have changed a little bit. I should say fortunately to, to a great degree. It's, it's just, it's changed. I mean, recording has changed. I no longer have uh, tape in my studio. I no longer have, oh, I have a few pieces of analog equipment in here, but most of it is digital. Most of it's recallable. There's a memory to it all uh, because that serves my needs. Once again, you know, it's how to get the job done. What tools are you going to use to get the job done? And mm -hmm. right now, what's available to me uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, to work in the studio for a long, long time. I pretty much know what I need to have. And that tells me, you know, you get this stuff and you leave all the rest behind. And then nostalgia is fine, but it doesn't it doesn't work. I mean, if you're doing something right now, you can have a nostalgic piece of gear and uh, it may take up a lot of room it may take up a lot of heat and energy and all that stuff if i can't get uh, better results with one of the newer pieces of equipment um and there's many that are out there and it's usually digital mm -hmm. um i'm i'm i'm, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna take that that piece of uh old equipment just for the nostalgic value i will use something that will give me 
the same or better results. I've got a board right now that's uh, quieter than my old board and performs better in many ways. I've I've checked it and I it's I found that these things uh, you know advance and they get better basically and it's mainly due to the fact that you know home recording has grown up and so much is at the fingertips of every musician and would-be engineer and producer that uh, you can pick and choose and, and if you pick correctly you can get some great stuff behind every piece of art there's a job that's got to be done so if you have to upgrade from homemade equipment or things that are more modern if that's what you got to do to get the job done to get the art out there then that's what you got to do so be it and like yep. you said there's always there's nothing wrong with having a bit of nostalgia but if that nostalgia gets in the way of the present then it's not exactly a positive experience and it's not exactly something you want to you want to have around at, at least when it comes to doing a job sure sure i mean that's the case with the i mean you know is uh, you do photography and videography a uh, hundred years ago, it was totally different. You wouldn't use that equipment. <laughs> no, not at all. No, you had to get underneath the little curtain thing and hold <laughs> up that little little joystick and say cheese, you know, yeah. and then <laughs> hold it there for about thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, and then before that, you had to have someone sit down for eight hours straight and paint them. That was right. photography. <laughs> you know, that stuff is fine to think about, but as far as doing something and producing something in this day and age. You have to look at everything that's available to you, all those tools that are available to you. And there's lots of them right now, thank goodness. Right, exactly. We are living in a prime age of just everything's available to us. I've almost made the argument that we maybe have plateaued because what's next? Like, what's the next big thing of equipment? We have everything from photography to videography, gaming, music. We have everything. Like, what's the next big thing? Well, see, when when AI really advances and matures, you may not even have to interview me. I, you know, you could have a, you know, uh, some kind of artificial intelligence putting my picture up on the screen and yeah, you know, that's... talking like I talk and in the same voice too. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a terrifying thought. I actually, if that's the case, then let's go backwards, please. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> well, remember, the main thing is, uh, you know, there have been uh, clunkers in every age with uh, both equipment and stuff like that you got to pick and choose and you got to be thoughtful about it very true so 13 songs by fugazi and specifically their hit waiting room are often cited as indie and punk staples of the 80s hearing that how does it feel knowing that you capture that for the world to hear wonderful you know i was there and i knew them and they recorded it at uh, at that point and um I I just you know I feel I feel gratitude that they would pick in rare studio to record at and um just I I'm, I'm hey man I'm just doing my job. <laughs> Do you think they felt the same way and then all of a sudden they start seeing like all of the uh at, at least nowadays all like the notoriety that they got they were like hey man we were just putting out music that we thought was uh that we liked. Did they yeah. expect to blow up that big? Um I don't know what they expected but uh, that that what you just said couldn't encapsulate the entire punk scene, uh, because if you remember, punk music was a very small uh, contingent of people to start out, mm. and very mm, well, that was a small group basically, and they they dressed different, uh, they listened to different music, and they just you know they were kind of outcasts in a sense, or uh, basically just a segregated group. They didn't necessarily know where their music was going and they pretty much uh i'd say overall were very unconfident that their music or musical style would last at all it was something that would be a very much a flash in the pan uh it's here and then it's gone and something else will quickly take its place now the fact that it didn't happen like that and there was an evolution of sorts uh, was, I think, uh, uh, surprised everyone, mm. including me. Uh, but it's hung around for a long, long time, much longer than they thought. But at the time, the fact that you are dealing with something that's very existential and it will be gone uh, very quickly, 
you put everything into it and you uh, it gives you free reign as far as trying things out and and experimenting and and uh, giving it your all basically because you're no one is going to see this or hear this uh, a year from now or you at least that you think that at the time and i think you, you said a word before that i think it could explain all of this in just you know one word timing because this was a time where even though they were an underground and you know they were a smaller group of people at the same time a lot of people just in general throughout america at least they had that like angst that anger and a lot of them were getting sick of the the pop scene at the time you know they were probably getting sick of the abbas and the bgs or whatever so when they heard something more raw and like something that they could actually relate to they started gravitating towards it and you know again this is something that has been seen in every decade again the 60s the 90s that's why nirvana blew up so big because you know people were getting so sick of the metal scene at the time that they were like wow this kurt cobain guy he's uh he's someone who's just like us and when they get that aesthetic they relate to it and enjoy the music so much more and i think that with guys like fugazi because i listened to 13 songs i had never i had always heard of fugazi i never listened to them but i listened to that album and I actually was surprised. I actually thoroughly enjoyed it. Like it was, it was good. Cause I mean, well, I'm getting into heavier stuff lately, like sludge metal, which is essentially like a baby of hardcore punk and doom. So when I heard that, I was like, yeah, this is actually, I enjoy this a lot more than I thought I was going to. So again, there's like that vibe that the normal person could relate to, you know, rather than the, the aristocrats. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. When you do things with a sense of abandon, sometimes they come out better than you ever thought. Mm -hmm. What is a lifelong lesson that you've learned from an artist or band you've produced for? Like, what is something that a band has taught you? Well, um, and I think maybe you can relate to this. No matter what your voice sounds like, you can use that as a musical instrument. Uh, because I, I didn't quite like the way my voice sounded uh, in years past, many years past. But as I heard a lot of their music, you said to yourself, you know, I could do this. And maybe, maybe I could even do this even a little bit better. And so you try it and you try experimenting with it and you, and you just work it to the point where, hey, maybe I've got something here that's, uh, that, that, that people may enjoy <laughs> it's a slow process it's a very slow process but i got to um, come to terms with my voice uh, in that way and i hope a lot of people have uh, and that goes for instrumental playing too a lot of them when they started out didn't know how to play their instruments very well uh, but they learned and maybe some of the people listening to the music took up the instruments and said you know they didn't know how to play either so I can I can do this and I can I can I can do something if I just sort of work at it. And it's like a there's almost a uniqueness to that. Yeah, there is. There certainly is. You find that your voice or your instrument is characteristic in one way or another and you run with it. Right, because someone somewhere out there is going to enjoy your music. You can't think everyone's gonna hate this. No. There's gonna be a group of people who will really enjoy what you're putting out. And that's a lesson that's come through time. I mean, Bob Dylan is one example. Tom Waits is another example where, you know, people were making fun of Bob Dylan's voice uh, for many ages. And, uh, you know, look where he is now. Household name. Yeah, I'll be honest. I Phenomenal songwriter. Phenomenal. I, I like folk to an extent, but I'll be honest. I, I, I do not like the guy's voice. I, I, I admire and I respect everything he has done for the music scene like again phenomenal writer but i just that voice just ain't for me and, I, and vocals are a huge thing for me in songs and i tend to like most vocal styles but that really nasally masters of the war no i can't do it i can't right but you've well you've just uh, said something you you've listened to his music right yeah oh yeah okay he's gotten his point across then yep he won. He won the. He, I won the battle. He won the war. So trust me. I know he. He. He checkmated me. <laughs> the most important thing for an artist, and I'm talking about any artist, it could be a 
comedian, uh, an actor, uh, a painter, a poet, is getting things across to people. Don't worry about whether or not you like or they like you or they like what you're doing or they think, uh, you know, this is this is not this is not good. You just throw it out there and try it. And this has been true with a lot of uh, more pop bands uh, through the ages, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of bands like, oh, for instance, the Kinks, uh, where they had they had a lot of misses to their their catalog for sure. But within those, they had hits. Mm -hmm. uh, Squeeze, another one. I'm I'm throwing these out simply because I'm of the pop music vein, so uh, they, they are. I'm familiar with their stuff. Um, the Birds. Mm. Uh, you you basically you just try and you work and you put out you produce you produce more and you produce more and some people are going to come up to your face and say they hate what you're doing and other people are going to come up to your face and say i just love what you're doing and either way you get your point across that person yep. listens to your music that's exactly it and from there it's just a matter of can you handle because people some you know most bands they go out into the scene and they want to they want everyone to love their music. They want everyone to hear it and be like, oh sure. my God, I love And you know, who doesn't want to be loved? Sure, but if you can handle the hate and say, hey, bad publicity is good publicity too. If you can handle that, you're chilling. Yep, that's exactly it. All right, I have one more question here. I always like mm -hmm. to end it off on a fun note. Uh, we're going to do one quick round of Wikipedia fact or fiction. I stole this idea from Loudwire. Essentially, I'm going to read a portion from one of your Wikipedia pages and you can let me know if it's fact or if it's fiction. Sure. And if you want to elaborate on it a little, you can as well. So on the Inner Ear Studio Wikipedia page, it says that before recording punk music, you recorded harp and Celtic folk. Fact or fiction? Fact. Okay. And is this coming from like the Polish upbringing with the accordion and all that stuff? Or Oh, no, 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 no. I uh, When I started recording, and when you break out, as you know, as an entrepreneur, you basically do anything to stay alive. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so I recorded uh, uh, oh, Celtic music, uh, all kinds. Of, uh, I guess I didn't get too much into country or Western music at all. Right. But, uh, different things, uh, voiceovers, uh, basically anything. If they were paying American dollars, um, I was there. I, I chose that because I was like, Celtic folk, that is complete polar opposite of punk I, I i wanted to see if that was true or not but honestly i but, respect it yeah and I, I must add uh it's not that far away from a lot of pop music they're melodic uh the harmonies are wonderful uh, and if you look through the ages different groups um for instance uh the the, the people in the birds they came out of different groups that were much more folk and much more um, uh, country oriented. Right. Chris Hillman is an example. Um, Gene Clark, I think he would, I forget what he came out of, uh, but basically they, they, they all sort of evolved for different things and folk plays a lot into it. And folk, uh, Celtic music is basically folk music with a, uh, uh, um, uh, a nationality stamp on it. Like the Dubliners, I think, would they be they considered like Celtic folk, I think, right? Sure. Yeah, because they're from Ireland. And if I could, if I could throw a, a, a folk song out there that's pretty obscure, Traveling Minstrel by Richard Torrance, really good song. I highly recommend it. I'm not familiar it. with it, yeah. Uh, old, yeah. Old 70s artist, and I think, I think you'd really like his music. I enjoy all styles of music, if it's good. Yes. Uh, I know that's kind of a, you know, a pat statement to say, but there are a lot of different genres that have good elements in them and you just have to look for it it's all based on a preference like you know like what is good to you may be abhorrent to someone else it's all based on preference all right mr is it pronounced zentara or zentara ah either way all right mr zentara don thank you so much for your time here today great conversation i really enjoyed it you know as someone who's never interviewed a music producer yet I actually felt like we, there was a really good conversation. I've learned a lot from you, sir. So I want to appreciate you for your time, your knowledge, and your commitment to the music scene, thank even you, to this day. You. So thank you so much for your time, sir.
You're quite welcome. Quite welcome.